So I'm not going back and forth with a man who thinks that they should be in my position. If you want to be in my position, get in my position. Do you believe that? Bluff City Media presents the Anthony Sane Show on YouTube at Bluff City Media. Stepping up to the microphone is your host, Anthony Sane. Acknowledge me. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Anthony Sane Show. This is, of course, your host, Anthony Sane, here live in the Bluff City Media Studios. Got Kenny Stubblefield behind the glass with me. Kenny, what's going on, brother? My brother, I have a question for you yeah, before go ahead, we get started go today. Ahead. You a fan of March Madness? Am I a fan I of March I know you're not a fan of college basketball as a whole, mm-hmm. but just in terms of this time of the year, the brackets, the, all that kind of stuff. Are you, mm-hmm. you like that stuff? You, um, you get in, you get excited by this time of the year? <laughs> I'm glad you said that, Kenny. Uh, I like the beginning. I like the first weekend, just right. kind of the – Buzzer beaters, upsets, that type of stuff. And I like I watched the Final Four National Championship game. Sometimes. I Sometimes. had watched it in a couple of years because I had I didn't see a second of it last year. But um the bracket stuff could kiss my ass. No bro. way, dude. Are you kidding <laughs> bro, me? No, I was super good, man. Same, even same when way. I was even I was only time I would really be into the brackets is if the Tigers are really good mm-hmm. and I'm watching where they go in the brackets. But like being the guy who's like the office bracket challenge guy and all that. Got you. Know. Okay, that part of it, you oh, know. Oh, that like, can go I got you. Yeah. Oh, I, the actual brackets of it themselves. I talked about that earlier with the uh, yeah. NBA in season tournament, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I like that whole aspect of tournaments and big tournaments. And yes. 64 bowling down to one. Anytime, all that, you, all get me, anytime you get me a, a tournament bracket where it's nailed, like kind of filtered down to one team that yeah. wins it all, I yeah. love that shit so much. And I kind of like, okay, the, the visual of the bracket is kind of. Calming and pleasing, right? It's kind of dope to see. Hundred percent. Do you like to see the thirty-two on thirty-two or the or the one big sixty-four? The thirty-two and thirty-two. Yeah, the the two two so sides colliding. The two sides yeah. colliding. <laughs> yeah. It's like you just start to see things kind of whittle down, like mm-hmm. it's like Tetris almost. Like it's just yeah, man. Yeah. I love it. It's uh, we're recording right in the middle of the first day of uh, yeah, man. of March Madness, and I just and this is screwed up too. I don't like it like this, bro. Is it? Hold on. Is this the? All the all the other games are out, right? Or these are the actual sixty four teams left. These right? are the sixty four. Okay, I ain't see, I ain't paid no attention to nothing today. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, man, it's um the whole that aspect, yeah, is dope. But the actual like brackets and like shout out to Bluff City Media has some type of challenge going on. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I told ain't. someone asked me the Discord if I was gonna put one together, <laughs> yeah, and I was like, man, honestly, can I just be frank with y'all? I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn. I promise I was like, you, I don't. I was like, listen, man, I'm done with college basketball for the year. Outside yeah. of just being a fan and watching it, yeah, because, it's cool like, to take. It's okay to take a break, man. Like yeah, for real, man. The, the Tigers, the Tigers. And this off season's not gonna give you a true break. <laughs> no. So yeah, there's plenty. Of, yeah, there's plenty more that came from for sure. Tigers took about ten years off my life this no, year. Man, this is this is the year for sure. But yeah, man. Um, yeah, I'm not really a fan of that whole thing. I don't really care about somebody's guessing. Oh, this just destroyed my bracket. Yeah, right. man, because oh. it's yeah, it's, because it's a crap. It's, it's real life. It ain't, it ain't <laughs> guessing about games. You know what I mean? Um, that that used to tick me off really bad. But what's the name? Came okay. Let me think. What was the timeline? The bracket discussions used to tick me off. Then the fantasy team stuff. The fantasy stuff is drives me crazy. That was, I was totally you're, super so you're not into fantasy at all. No. And then the betting stuff too. Because people are like, people would call me and be like, who you think, who you who you got coming out of so and so bracket? Like, bro, I don't keep up with college basketball. I don't know. Right. And then like people are calling me like, okay, who you think will have a good game tonight between so and so, so and so? Then I, you know, I get annoyed by those conversations. And then people now people ask me, you know, how many rebounds you think? Right. You know, Over under seven rebounds. What's right, my par? What should be my par? Like, yeah, like, like I, I don't listen, know, bro. <laughs> we got plenty of folks at BCM who Man, love that stuff. I, I don't know why people ask me that, bro. Like, right. I, I never say anything that makes people think that I'm into that type of stuff. Like, I've bet before. I ain't betting probably over a year. I used to bet almost daily. I used to bet at least 10 bucks on something every day. Yeah. Then I started looking at them like, yeah, hey, I'm down a lot, right? I'm down a lot. <laughs> I'm just giving these folks money, bro. So, uh, yeah, so I kind of stopped. All that or whatever. Every now and again, I jump. It's probably been over a year since I bet anything, though. Know? But hey, FanDuel, you know? if y'all want to sponsor the show, hey, I will become a bet I'll, man. I'll, I'll bet and my I'll ass tell off. you the Saint Asylum picks of the day. <laughs> yes, sir. We'll start doing yeah, Saint yeah. Asylum picks of the day. Man, the what? parlay, Saint Asylum parlay of the man, day. Man, what? Baby. <laughs> I've turned into a uh, fake ass Daniel Greer real so, quick. FanDuel, reach out if y'all hey, want to sponsor the Saint Show. Whoever, man, you saw ESPN's got a betting app now. Yeah, they took over from uh, they they dropped uh, what's it called? Or no, they they um, Penn Station, the uh, the the company that bought. Barstool, um, bar, that's what Barstool's all about now is betting. Oh, and wow. Penn Station took over that. Then they sold they sold it back to Dave Portnoy for a dollar, so that Penn Station could then join ESPN and do ESPN bets. Oh wow! So yeah, it's, it's like a, I mean they're trying to take over the they're trying to take over it all at this point. Yeah, yeah. It's you wild. think you think it'll compete with FanDuel? 
dog. We're talking about it's the the limitless. On this we're talking about yeah. limitless money. It's ESPN, bro. Right? Yep. Damn. Yeah, it could be. Man, that just seems like too much, bro. When like an actual like a sports broadcast network is involved in gambling. <laughs> like it just seems like But not oh, even no, that. Man. But not even that as well. They also have television rights and they have so much money you know wrapped up in all the leagues and the money and the sport they're they're engaged if people don't think that espn and disney and all these places are not and fox aren't actively wrapped up in decision making behind mm-hmm. the scenes for these leagues and now they're betting on it it just feels yeah it feels yeah. weird doesn't it because you know wwe is, is has like gambling uh, elements to it too now. right i'm like man this stuff is crazy bro but yeah it's um yeah the times we live in man gambling is definitely a big deal Brackets are a big deal, so uh, I get that whole thing. But uh, since the last time we talked, Kenny, uh, the Memphis Grizzlies uh, played last night against the Golden State Warriors. And it's funny how, like, you call a team, like, a couple years ago, people were saying the Grizzlies and the Warriors have a rivalry, right? And we played on Sunday night. Maybe we played on, not Sunday night, we played on Christmas Day. I don't know where I got Sunday night for. We played on Christmas Day, right? We played on Christmas Day, and it was this rivalry thing, and everybody was like, well, you know, it's the it's the the old transition into the new, right? And then it seems like that whole I, I never got excited about it because I was like, okay, we're on totally different timelines, and I think we're seeing that because the Warriors right. are fading fading out in front of our right, eyes, right? Right, right, right. They beat they beat the hell out of us last night, but we're you know we're G League team right now. Yeah, but you could tell that the Warriors we've seen their last the last of that team as far as being a con- championship contending team. There's no way that team is going to be good in the playoffs. I I hope I'm not wrong on that, but um. It does appear that you know they're going to be that this is that they're going away. I mean, the Warriors dynasty is about to end, and you see a Grizzlies team who uh, is loading up, preparing for the future, and those type of things. Um, it seems like their best years are ahead of them. At yeah, this point. exactly. And and I think that the Grizzlies' real rival will be the Oklahoma City Thunder, which is something it, uh, it, if we, that excites me. Oh man, and it's the way it should be, bro. Because if you think about it. A lot of people argue at this point with me. I'm like, all right, you don't have to agree, but I'm right. <laughs> I mean, but that's fine. Like, when I tell people the Clippers were not were not our rivals, like, people get upset with me when I say that. Like, saying you're, you're talking out your ass. No, I'm not. We we didn't like the Clippers, but the Clippers had no clue why we didn't like them. Like, they we, they were not our – I mean, we were not their I don't rivals. believe that to be true at all. The Clippers did not, did not hate us the way we hated them, bro. That was a very one-sided rivalry, fan. I don't know about that, dude. We they saw them in the man. playoffs every year. They didn't. They didn't. They felt they the way we felt about them. They felt about the Golden State Warriors like that. Like that was not the Clippers did not care about us the way they cared, we cared about them, bro. It was a very one sided rivalry. And regardless of, of if you agree with that or not, the Thunder rivalry was the, the Memphis Grizzlies' first rivalry. Like that was our first one. The, the one the, with KD and Russ and all that. Yes, because that team it was it was the same kind of thing because it was like a team that was. Cause um, up and coming, up and coming, all guys are all the same age, pretty much. Right. It was uh, KD versus Rudy Gay at first, and then that faded out, and Zebo and them came, and um, that was our original rivalry, bro. Then the Clippers came in. We couldn't, but the Thunder and the Grizzlies both had beef with each other. Like that was a real beef back then. What was the beef? Do you know? I don't know. There was just guys who it just made sense. They lined up in age, and there was just well, guys. Zach who Zach Randolph, Kendrick Perkins. Yeah, I mean, all they, that. Yeah. Like yeah, it was. It was uh, like I said, Rudy. Rudy came a year before KD, and they were saying that KD was, was – Rudy is one of the guys that KD kind of patterned his game after. And then that ended because KD went to be KD or whatever. KD's KD. Yeah, and then you had Russ. Uh, Russ was in the same draft class as like O.J. Mayo and them. And then the, the, the players changed. You get, you brought in Zebo, Tony Allen, those type of guys. But that was our real – first real rivalry, and it kind of lasted for a while. We had several series in Oklahoma City as well. But this new incarnation of Oklahoma City – and this Grizzlies team, oh my God, that's they, gonna be. Looks it. like they're shaping up to be not only a rivalry, but the two best teams in the West. Like they are shaping up to be what they've tried to make the Lakers and Warriors be this last couple of years. You know yeah. what I mean? That, I mean, the script is laying is laying itself out <laughs> like never before, man. If you just be honest with you, with, with it, when you, especially when you see how the Grizzlies are lining up, finding guys like Vince Williams, finding guys like Gigi Jackson to add to this core of guys, it just looks like. You know, those are about to be the two best teams in the West uh, going forward. A young point guard. Yeah, oh, it, it lines up. A, a good big man. lines up too good. And, like, the, the 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 future of the league, in my opinion, is Grizzlies, um, Nuggets, of course, Oklahoma City, 
Minnesota. Those are the four best teams in the West to me mm. going forward. Sacramento's around there somewhere. Phoenix is about to fade out. Golden State Warriors is about to fade out. The Lakers are about to be done. Clippers are about to be done. Clippers are about to be done. Dallas is going to be around there somewhere. Dallas, I can I wouldn't be surprised if Dallas blows that whole thing up this summer though. Um, but yeah, I just think those are the, you know, the 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 that that matchup is coming. But a key element about this Grizzlies team going forward <clears throat> is the small forward position. And we talked about this stuff today, mm. and I'm gonna dig into it again, uh, revisit it a little bit today. Shout out to Chris uh, Chris Ingram, man, who can who can stir up a daily Twitter conversation uh, for engagement like like no other. And I don't mean like engagement, honey, but he makes good points that a lot of people just jump in on, and he he kind of keeps it where he he knows how to kind of do it where it's like he's hard to argue with. Yeah, because he just kind of <laughs> yeah. well because like he says real like here's here's what here's his his formula and I like it. Mm-hmm. I'm not to give away his game. I don't. I haven't ever said this to him. Mm-hmm. He says something outlandish and then gets pushed back and then has non outlandish facts to back yep. it up. Exactly. Cause his, his thing is he says that he thinks that, um, that GG could be the second leading scorer behind Ja, Right. And, um, he, like he could, he put it in, he put it in a, he put it into a formula. He said, mm-hmm. Ja, GG, Des, Jaren. Jaren. Yep. In order, in terms of importance to this franchise. Yep. I can see that though. But here's here's the thing that I had this conversation with him. I don't know if we did it on wax or not, but I think the best version of a Grizzlies team is a team where John Moran is not the leading scorer. If if John can find a way to get another guy where that's the leading scorer and John plays off of him, that's that's the way it should be. If you look at champions NBA championship history, when was the last time outside of Steph Curry, who was a phenomenal three point shooter, when was the last time that a non like high tier three point shooter was the point guard on a championship team? Let me think. Jamal Murray, high tier, right? He wasn't the top. He wasn't the best player on that team. Okay, so 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 the criteria. Oh, I said it wrong. Yeah, best player on the team is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, got you. Okay. Where the best player on the team is a non obviously elite Jokic. level three point shooter. Let me think. I can't think of one. <laughs> like, because even if you go like Kyrie and LeBron, that was Le- was LeBron's team. Yeah, it was LeBron's team. And Kyrie was a high level three point shooter. He went like crazy. Like I Steph mean, is Steph him. is the anomaly, right? Because yeah. he's the best shooter to ever play yeah. the game. But I think you might be right on that. Smalls normally don't win championships for teams. They're not the best player on the team like that. Right. Um, you know, it's usually your 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 big wings are that guy. So I think in in a perfect world, Gigi would be the guy that you're you know in two or three years if he if he ends up being that dude. You know, what I mean, that would be a perfect world situation where you've got that big wing, that big three three four type guy who's the best player on the team. But the Grizzlies are really setting up to be absolutely amazing. But to uh, speak on uh, Chris's thing, he was talking about who should be the starting small forward. And we talked about this last year. I mean, last uh, show um, when we had Paris on. This is where I stand on that whole thing. And I, uh, Francis Carlotta, of, of all people, <laughs> made this point on Twitter, and I co-signed him. I quoted his tweet, and I agreed with him. What a hell of a, a good situation to be in. What a problem. Right. What a problem to have, man, when you're talking about who should be our starter, Marcus Smart, Vince Williams, or Gigi Jackson, right? Three guys who I think can all do it. You know <laughs> what I mean? Who can do it? And I can I can write a a uh, five-page article about why either one of them should be that dude, right? Um, I can see I can see I see it totally. And Chris made some good points. Like, don't tell me it can't happen when when uh, um, Michael Porter Jr. is starting in, in Denver. You know what I mean? Um, and that's a team that kind of lines up almost like we do as far as um, it's kind of in a way they line up with us, like like what how they're using their dudes. Right? But then doesn't that kind of fly in the face of what you're talking about then? What you mean? About the the level of importance. Because Michael Porter Jr. is probably, would you say, third or fourth on the pecking order? And that, and that starting lineup, he's fourth, yeah. But offensively, you know he can go there, you know, when when he has those type of games. And when he does go there, they become almost unbeatable. Unguardable, yeah. Right? Yeah. But only thing with that is, um, I don't, I'm not sure I want to, even though he's a very good defender, I don't think I want a starting lineup where Gigi has to guard LeBron. I don't, want, guard, I don't want that either. Or has to guard uh, KD, or has to, not even big guys like that. I don't, I don't want him guarding Devin Booker or... I don't. I'm not. I'm, I don't mean to just put six, eight, six, nine dudes. I don't want him to be the wing defender on this team. Like, right? I think that's kind of a poor use of of a guy of his talent because in Denver they've got uh, what's the kid's name, the shooting guard there, 
They they had um, I'm so terrible with names, bro. I see these guys' faces. I just can't tell you what their names are. Um, Bruce Brown. Yeah, Bruce Brown last year, and they got what's his name there this oh, year. Oh, uh, Contavious. Contavious Caldwell Pope. Pope. You know, those are your perimeter defenders. He's getting the, the those matchups, and that makes a guy like Michael Porter Jr. You can hide him a little bit on defense, right? But if it's G.G. Bain and Ja, like G.G.'s gonna have to check the you, well, you because you gotta hide Ja. Yeah, you gotta hide, you gotta hide Ja. And Bain is not like a you know he's not a really good defender. He's fine, uh, he's, you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. Short arms, all that type of stuff. I mean, Bain's fine, but he's not like he. You know, you're not gonna put, you're not gonna make Bain your primary defender. You know what I mean? So right. that's the only part of that, of that argument. So then you have Marcus Smart out there who could be your primary wing defender, right? Alongside Ja, but he's, I mean, he's limited Jr. height wise. You know what I mean? Right. Vince would be the perfect dude as far as he's six right. five with super long arms. He can defend pretty much anybody. He can knock down threes. He'll be more facilitate. Of a, yeah, play he make. can. Yeah, and he's gonna be a guy that's a connector. He's not gonna be out there. Trying to get his shots off, but he's a guy. If you need him to knock down the shot, cool. Gigi can make this that team unguardable, and he really can help the half court offense because he's a, another guy. You can say, okay, Gigi, go get a bucket, and Gigi can go get you a bucket. You know what I mean? But, and and the, the beauty of Gigi is that even in his first year, his his rookie year, you can already see the way that his mind works when it comes to playing in that half court mm-hmm. offense. He doesn't take shots outside of the offense. He no. doesn't. He the, he's not a. The ball comes to him and he stops and he takes a corner through. Like right. he's he's in the flow of the offense, getting shots yep. off. Yeah, and it's I think it's a super exciting problem to have, man. Like I, I don't know how it's gonna go now. But like I told, like I said to when I quoted Francis, wake me up and and, and let me know what happens because I'll be excited either way. Because uh, I, I I have no issue with either one of those guys being your starting small forward. And the crazy part about it mm-hmm. is, two out of those three guys, you got locked down for the next four mm-hmm. years. Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. And I'm a guy, man, and Chris said something today that really – Chris said something that just kind of convinces me and it makes me think for real. And I, 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 I've I, been ruling this out, but today I started thinking, man, that would be an awesome possibility. Like, how do we know – because my thing is, is that Marcus Smart is not going to want a diminished role because he played with Tatum, he played with Brown, he played with those guys. He started with those guys, right? Derek White was on the team. Right. Brogdon, all four of those dudes played for Boston at the same time. And Marcus Smart was still starting. You know what I mean? I mean, come on, man. Right. And so I could see him being like, no, nah, man, like I'm not coming off the bench for these dudes. I, and I can see that. And I can see him being, you know, just a former defensive player of the year. I can see him having that level of pride. I'm like, man, just trade me. Just send me. I can see him being that dude. But how do we know that Marcus Smart is like, man, you know what? I could come to Memphis, man, hang around, be here with this team, save my body, play longer, make a lot of money. Make a lot of it. money. They'll probably play me. They'll probably pay me twelve to fifteen million for the next. I could probably get another deal like you that. You could get another contract out of that. And that money moved different in Memphis than it moved in, in Boston or Shit. Miami or New York or LA or wherever I'm talking about going. And I could just be here with this young group of kids. I like it here. I've been able to sit down this whole season, almost being like an assistant coach. How do we know that Marcus Smart even wants to start? How do we know Marcus Smart be like, all right, man, whatever. I'll come in and do what y'all want me to do. And who, he walks out of Memphis as much of a legend in Memphis as he does in Boston. He could be a Tony Allen type He could type be a Tony Allen type legendary yeah. figure. Yeah. How do we know that, that that timeline don't exist? You know what I mean? So it's exciting times, man. It's an exciting problem to have, like I said. But we're about to take a break, man. And I'm super excited about who's about to come on the show I give this young man a hard time almost every time we hit record, uh, especially if we're talking Tiger basketball. Mr. Go Easy on Roman himself, man. <laughs> Roman Cleary is in the building. About to bring my man Roman Cleary, man. The Memphis Tiger B writer for Bluff City Media is coming on. He's uh, an awesome dude, man. I pulled for him because of his age. He's 19 years old doing this thing. When I was 19, I don't know what I was doing. Yeah. I wasn't doing it. <laughs> I wasn't doing this at all. And my man Roman Cleary is in the building for the sit down with Sane. We'll see him when we come back here on the Anthony Sane Show. See you guys in a minute. Let's let's operate on the idea that they do win this tournament, get into the field of 68. What does that do to your perception of this year? Nothing. But I think winning it would be a soft landing for Penny and the and, and like the staff. Absolutely. And for everybody, because I think even if they win, for me, it's still a disappointing year. I think a lot of people in this fan base would be like, oh. They still made it. They still time. made it. He did he did what he promised. Right. Yada yada yada. And we we know what could have been this year and what ultimately will not be 
because of the deficiencies that this team had and the way that they were constructed. This is the this is the biggest what if team that I tune into on the bluff with Christian Fowler and Gabe Kuhn every Tuesday at 12 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. And we say all this, and now there's already talk. They haven't even done the 12 team. And Kenny, they're Expand already, again. they're already talking about expanding it to 14 in 2026. I'm down for every bit of it. I am too. Expand it. Keep going. Kenny, have you seen what the proposal is for the expanded to 14? Three guaranteed SEC, three guaranteed Big Ten. That's six. Two ACC, two Big 12. So now you're at 10, and then one G5. Three at large. Three at large. Top two. That's going to be that way anyway, is it? I mean, it's going to be that way anyway. So why not? Yeah, likely. I don't mind it if it gets the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big Twelve, the all those power conferences on board. Do it. Why not? As long as we still get a shot. Yeah, I think as long as any G five still has a chance, right? Tune in to Tigers Untapped with TJ Willis and Trey Lasley every Wednesday at three p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. All right, y'all, welcome back to the Anthony Sane Show. I told y'all, my man, Roman Cleary is going to be in the building. Roman Cleary is clearly one of my favorite media members in the city of Memphis, man. <laughs> like, uh, I pulled for him because he's young. I ain't going to lie, man. I, I kind of got a one white person quota. Yeah, it's, for, uh, it's Roman. Wait, what oh, about me, I, man? I, I'm in your one white person no, quota? No, no, no. You know, I got a silent media group, right? You know, I got oh, yeah. my, gotcha. my mentor group. Gotcha. I will reach out to Roman, man, but I, it might change the demographic a little bit too much. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, nah, man. <laughs> but Roman's my guy, though. You know what I mean? It's my, you my guy, man, for real. <laughs> you my guy. I, I appreciate that, man. Roman, I don't, I don't know how many firsts you had in your life. There's a couple of firsts they're going to be on me, man. I ain't going to get into the details, but I'm going <laughs> to take care of you. Just, I'm going to take care of you, bro. They're going to be on me. Yeah, for sure. I'm yeah. I, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I think this is a little bit overdue. I've been catching strays on this show oh, for about man, a I've been, month. I've been now, on man. you, man. I've been on you, man. For about real. a month. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Whether they were deserved or not is up for debate. I'm not here to decide <laughs> here today, but it's all love, man. It's all love. <laughs> all love you know that? bro. Because <laughs> he's trying. Hey, Anthony's trying to protect you, bro. Yeah. He's trying to protect you. Couple people are like, uh, people are saying like, you know, the stuff with. We'll talk about this with, with dangers okay. and things like that. People were attacking you and Hitman. I was like, no, nah, y'all could do that shit with Hitman, but not, not my guy Roman, man. Don't don't throw don't uh, throw Roman. <laughs> Damn Hitman ass, but we ain't doing this with man, what, what, What's wrong with Hitman though? I mean, I don't know nothing about Hitman. Who does know something about you? You seen him before? You yeah, seen him in person? Yeah, I, I've known him for more than half a year now. Oh, okay, so guy, he's, right. he's a nice guy. Once but you, you know get what he looks like. Once you get to know him, yeah, I know what he looks like. Oh, okay. He's a nice guy that once you get to know him a little bit, he's <laughs> he's good to talk to. He he comes off a little. You know, standoffish, but yeah. once you get him to trust you, he's a he's tolerable to be around at the very least. Well, that's what's up. But Man, said tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the yes. day, yes. When, when people try to group y'all together and, and, and jump on y'all, no, nah, not Roman, man. Y'all no, ain't no. gonna do my guy like that. Uh, all up for Hitman, though. Yeah, Thanks. my guy. <laughs> Roman Clear in the building. My guy Hitman, too. I fool with Hitman, man. I, I like for Hitman to think I don't really care for him. It ain't that I don't care for him. He's just kind of on some weirdo stuff often. Like, I see him kind of intertw intertwined with people, and I'm like, okay, bro. What are you doing? <laughs> like, yeah, so, um, so yeah. that's that's been my thing with Hitman. So, but yeah, it's the CD world of uh, yeah. insider, insider world. Yeah, <laughs> I, I need to I need to see what that world is all about. But like I said, I got my guy Roman Cleary here, who's the Tigers beat writer for Bluff City Media. Done a tremendous job in his first year, man. Like I said, I, when I was thank 19, you. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's all good, man. When I was nineteen, I wasn't thinking about nothing that had to do with this. But so you're definitely ahead of schedule. But with that being said, man, you cover uh, a nationally recognized. Uh, basketball program in Memphis uh, with a very high profile coach in Penny Hardaway. Yeah. Uh, tell us more about your journey in journalism and what got you to where you are now doing it. Okay. So my, my story, I, I guess is unique, unique in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I was born with Asperger's, which is mm -hmm. more so now know today is like a, a mild form of autism or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I had a bit more of a struggle than most kids in terms of like, finding friends, finding out identity, mm. that kind of stuff right in school. And when I was about 10, 11, 12 years old, something like that, um, I kind of discovered sports for the first time, you know, mm -hmm. football, basketball mainly, were what I fell, uh, fell in love with. You know, before that, it was wrestling. Big WWE guy. Oh, man. And I didn't know that. Yeah, that, right, that, that love's being reignited since then with the improvement of that product over there. But, yeah. Um, 
I got super into football when I was like 11, and basketball came mm-hmm. shortly after that. And of course, what's the first step in terms of, you know, getting involved with sports and loving sports is trying to play, right? Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> that's 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 what I did. I ended up, you know, going out for football in my seventh and eighth grade year. And uh, unfortunately, uh, wasn't exactly the most athletic guy in the world, so mm-hmm. ended up getting slotted at the good old lineman spot. I was one of those kids yeah. that, you know, was, was, was small, probably should have been a receiver or a corner or something like that, but I ended up play, playing lineman. I was put at left tackle in, in my first year, <laughs> but, which actually wasn't as bad as it sounded because we were in a league where, um, you know, it, it was kind of smaller kids, basically. Mm-hmm. So I could handle myself at left tackle because I was taller and, you know, a bit lengthier than most yeah. of the kids out there. So I held my own. And I actually ended up being a team captain or whatever because I just brought the energy <laughs> every practice, man. I don't know how good of a leader I actually was, uh, but I just brought that energy every practice, man. Yeah. So um, I, I was the team captain and we didn't win that many games. In the regular season, but our league only had four teams in it, so we just made the playoffs by default. And we went on what I guess what you would call a magical run. We won our first playoff game. Uh, I apparently made like the game-winning blindside block mm-hmm. that allowed our running back to go all the way to the end zone for a touchdown or whatever, yeah. and that ended up being uh, the game winner. Everyone's like, "Roman, you 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 made the blindside block for the win." Like, <laughs> I didn't even notice it while I was on the field. I was just doing my job, and all of a sudden, yeah. we were running like a halfback stretch or a toss or something like that to the left. And, of course, that means I'm the lead blocker on his left tackle. And he, he just runs right by me and goes away for the score. That was what all it was from my perspective. But everyone was telling me at the end that I made the game-winning block. So yeah. I guess that was significant. We got absolutely smacked in the championship. But mm-hmm. you know what? Uh, getting there was uh, all fun and good. But, unfortunately, second year, complete disaster. <laughs> like, complete disaster. First off, the coach that made me a captain and I had built rapport with. He was gone. Yeah, he was gone. Right. He ended up taking another job at another city hall in like Illinois or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the new coach and I, we got along fine, but we just didn't mesh all that well. Right. And I also got moved off of the left tackle spot that I had been, I guess, okay with in my f- First year, mm-hmm. and ended up getting moved to the defensive line. Oh man! And if <laughs> if you why did I tell this dude that man was that dude on the line? Man, I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh got, man! Got moved to the defensive line, and we were in a much more talented league this time yeah. around. Like mm-hmm. we kind of jumped up, which means bigger linemen to go up against. And when you're someone who has no pass rush moves, <laughs> no run stopping <laughs> abilities or nothing, right. and you're like 110 pounds, yeah, not going to work out so well. Because it's, it's a big jump from 7th grade to 8th grade. For yeah. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, I guess so. Yeah, but It's called puberty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, we, I remember one game so vividly. This may have been the last snap I ever, I ever <laughs> ended up playing. And we were in Horn Lake, Mississippi. We were playing mm-hmm. a game in Horn Lake. I don't even remember what the team was called we were playing. But I remember I got subbed in there. I, I, I played much less in my second year, more so of a, a bench guy. I was a, the starting tackle my first year, but kind of a bench rider my second year. And, but I got in there for two plays in this game in Horn Lake. Mm-hmm. And I get moved to the, ins- the left inside defensive tackle spot. You know, we were running a 4-3, and I was the left interior defensive tackle. <laughs> and I got pancaked by not one, but two interior guards that had to have been at least like 200 something pounds. Yeah, you realize fast. Yeah. <laughs> no. You get on the other side of sports. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. But no, I got I got pancaked once uh-huh. and then for some godforsaken reason, I get left in the game after that <laughs> and you guess what happens? I get pancaked, I get smushed by these two guys again mm-hmm. and I believe that was the last time I ever stepped on the field in an official capacity. <laughs> and you realize I, you need to. I may yeah. be wrong about that. And then my, my season ended up getting ended prematurely by a broken thumb that I suffered mm. while tossing football on the beach. On your right hand. Break. Imagine if, if that thumb had prevented you from writing stories at this point. Uh, yeah, that, that would that, that would have been tough. But yeah. luckily, the, the thumb healed nice and well. Yeah. But obviously, that was about the time where I realized, hey, I love the sports stuff. But man, <laughs> being an athlete just isn't exactly my cards. Yeah. So... I decided from that point on I wanted to, you know, be in media because mm-hmm. that was just the the avenue that attracted me the most. Mm-hmm. And I figured that was going to be more of a college thing, more of a, you know, a, an adulting thing. And <clears throat> I was going to do what I could in high school to right. try and set myself on that path. But I just didn't know what kind of avenues were going to be there. But luckily, I was very fortunate to go to a fantastic school in Arlington that mm-hmm. had a really good, like, film and TV program mm-hmm. that was just, like, getting on the rise as I was 
coming up. Yeah. And they really were starting to get into like live streaming sports broadcasts for like the football team and the basketball team and all that. And they needed someone to announce the games. And when I expressed interest in doing that, uh, my student council sponsor, uh, Miss Sarah Kelly, I want to shout her out because mm-hmm. she really set me on this path. <clears throat> but she recommended me to the film and TV people. And I ended up being a color commentator for the last football game of the year mm-hmm. in my freshman year. By sophomore year, I took over as the lead play-by-play announcer. And I was in that gig for about three years, I want to say. Yeah, sophomore, junior, senior year. I was pretty much their lead sports announcer for most major sports. I called football. I called basketball. I even did a little bit of baseball towards the end of my senior year. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of the announcing stuff throughout (laughs) high school. And that was pretty much all my background was in uh, by the time I got to college. But I ended up doing more of the writing thing after my freshman year in college. I Mm -hmm. kind of laid back a little bit during freshman year trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Wasn't really calling games or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I did a, a radio show on our student radio network, The Roar, for a little bit. That was about it. But um, that was when, uh, around that time, that's when, you know, people were starting to do, like, the Twitter spaces, considering, mm-hmm. like, Memphis Tigers recruiting and all that. So mm-hmm. I decided to jump into those, you know, just because just I ended up becoming a pretty regular speaker on there after a while. Right. And then I get connected with uh, the people from Tiger Blueprint, mm-hmm. and I start writing for there, and I become their, their lead writer uh, pretty quickly. And that led to me getting the job here at, at BCM, yeah, which man. is... Uh, led me to where I am now. Yeah, we're definitely glad to have you, man, for sure. Well, yeah. hopping into some of the on court stuff with the Tigers, we've seen a true roller coaster of a season, man. Yeah, for his, sure. When his team is showing <laughs> you one version that looks like a top ten team in the country, you know, beating some of the, beating some good teams, good names like historic programs, just running through them, um, and we saw them fall off, and we saw them looking looking like themselves again. Like, oh man, that that team's going. I said it like, man, that team's going to win the conference tournament, right? <laughs> when they beat FAU, I'm like, yeah, that team's going to win the conference tournament. Like, you you have those type of emotions. Yeah. What do you think happened, man? What do you – like, first of all, I ask you this. Like, what is the real this real Memphis Tiger team? Are they closer to the team that was number 10 in the country? Are they closer to the team that lost to Wichita State the last game of the season? And just what happened? Like, who are these guys and what happened? To be honest, I don't think we'll ever really know mm-hmm. because we just saw so many different versions of yeah. what this team was. We saw the version that – you know, was 15 and two and ranked number mm-hmm. 10 of the country for the first two months of the season. But it was really a, a an astronomical collapse from mm-hmm. there. And then it was just up and down, up and down, up and down. I honestly thought they were playing their best ball of the year for the two, three week stretch in February. I thought mm-hmm. they looked better than ever at that point. And I was pretty confident in their chances. When they had to, Tomlin cooking and yeah, to, yeah. to win the AAC tournament mm-hmm. because like, if Memphis is playing this well, I don't care how many games they have to play in how many days. They're yep. not going to lose. But yeah, that just never came to fruition, <laughs> yeah. obviously. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I brought this up on like our Tigers Live post-mortem episode that we did last Sunday. And uh, I'll bring it up again here. I think it ultimately just came down to the fact that this team never fully comprehended that a college basketball season is a marathon and not mm-hmm. a sprint. This team, they did a lot of sprinting. And they sprinted very fast, but uh, they never, you know, they were too much of the, of the hare as opposed to the tortoise. They didn't, they never took a a look back and Mm kind of realized, Hey, here are some things that we could be doing better. No, they were just like, Oh, we, we won four in a row. Yeah. We, we may have taken ourselves out of at large contention, but Mm -hmm. you know what? We're back to where we were before. Uh, We don't have to work hard anymore. We don't have to, you know, go into the games with went with a winning mentality more it was a real sense of entitlement from Mm -hmm. a team that was obviously very heralded heading into the year you had so many guys that were Mm -hmm. used to being in big spotlights you know the the david joneses the javon quinterly's the jake one walton's the jordan Mm -hmm. browns but the guys that had to take a step back and had to you know take a more reserve role they never fully comprehended how to do that Mm -hmm. And it's just a, an unfortunate thing. I don't. I don't know if there's a singular answer as to what exactly went wrong because there mm-hmm. are just so many. Fa- like it, it. It isn't just one thing that goes wrong when you see a collapse like what we saw with Memphis this year. There, yeah. there, there's not. I mean, you have the chemistry issues. You have the effort issues. Uh, you have you know Penny making certain questionable decisions like bringing back Jordan Brown after mm-hmm. <laughs> he had completely bailed the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
You have all the defensive stuff that was going on. They were terrible at defending the three-point line. Mm-hmm. The defensive IQ just wasn't good. They were switching too much. They were overhelping too much. Uh, I I guess this team just didn't exactly have the mentality nor the skill set to do exactly what Penny Hardaway wants to do. I think we learned that uh, as good as Penny is as a coach, and I'm higher on him as a coach than most, mm-hmm. but he just does not know how to – lead an offensive oriented team it just doesn't which is so strange because penny was one of the best yeah. offensive players of all Pe- time you know yeah, what I mean? like a, penny was a fantastic everything yeah. really like he was a a maestro yeah offensively and he was a, he was pretty locked defensively he, he was a super high effort high energy player and i guess from his perspective perspective it's a little hard to comprehend you know guys not exactly being of that same mindset of that same mold mm-hmm. but i think that just goes that just goes with the new era that we're in here today, mm-hmm. honestly, because these kids are coming up in like AAU ball where it's it's more so just about coming out, playing yeah. freestyle in these AAU games as opposed to really yeah. practicing and coming together as a team. So when they get to the college game, that's still kind of sticking to that, you know, more traditional mold. It's a mm-hmm. real shell shock, I think, for a lot of these, you know, players that have been so used to something different, which is why a lot of these, you know, people who are superstars in high school, their game already translates better to the NBA than it does to college because college basketball is such a different game in and of itself where teamwork and effort and IQ is still going to win where it it may not be that way in other levels of basketball. Let's, let's stay there for a minute because you were talking about Penny Hardaway, right? Yes. And I was sitting up here doing math in my head and you said, I know you're 19 years old. I'm 44 years old. Hmm. I'm 25 years old than you, right? I'm thinking in my head, like, this kid ain't never seen Penny play basketball, <laughs> right? So I'm like, so my thing is, I know you've seen him. I know you've seen some type of highlights, but you never saw Penny. At least not the version of Penny I yeah, saw no. in, in live in the stereo. You've never seen that version of Penny. So with that being, because I, I had a rant in my last show, and I was talking about guys that are younger than me who are like these super Penny fans are like standing for Penny. And I'm like, okay, I'm a Penny Hardaway super fan too, but it's a totally different relationship. My Penny Hardaway was like, you know, one of the best players in the NBA right now. I, look, I looked at Penny like like my son looks at John Morant and Jaron Jackson Jr., right? Like, so who, like, like to me, Penny would have been the best point guard of all time. If you didn't right. But who is Penny to you, though? Like, you, you're so much younger than I am. Like, is he the guy with the shoes or is he just a guy your parents talked about? Like, who – how do you how do you relate to Penny Hardaway? Well – I guess for our generation, Penny Hardaway is just a symbol mm-hmm. of excellence, not just mm. in you know the basketball side of Memphis, but really he's a he's a real Memphis success story, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. he grew up in the in the poor neighborhood of Binghampton, mm-hmm. you know, became a, a highly heralded high school recruit, number one recruit in the country, mm-hmm. just you know to have too too bad of grades to not be able to play in his freshman year, so mm-hmm. he has to fight through that get on the Dean's list and everything. And then as he's about to play, he ends up getting shot in the foot during a mugging Mm -hmm. and he still finds a way to come back and have a very successful college career at Memphis state, leads into the elite eight and all that. Mm -hmm. Then he becomes, you know, a lottery pick in the NBA forms the duo with Shaq and Orlando. Uh, I, they were probably on pace to being that team that was finally able to take down the Jordan bulls before that whole situation fell Mm -hmm. apart. And then Penny gets hurt and everything, but still, what Penny Hardaway was at his peak is mm-hmm. the greatest Memphis athlete we've ever had yeah. as a city. And we, I think, I feel like our generation, while we didn't see him in person, we still have a, a lot of respect for that. Of course, we know him more as a coach because that's just what we know now mm-hmm. in, in the more modern time. But no, he, he's definitely still a symbol of like excellence, not just yeah. on the athletic part, but just a success story in the city as a whole. Yeah. So I, I asked that question to set up to the next question. Um, you got a lot of criticism as being part of the the breaking news about Malcolm Dandridge and the athletic situation. Yes. Right? So you definitely understand, you definitely have an understanding of who Penny Hardaway is and, and empathize with fans who probably came at you negatively when that situation came out. Yeah. How did you, how did you manage the criticism even that came with you just breaking honest news, news that's going to come out anyway, one way or another. How did, how did you manage the, the neg- negativity and criticism that came with breaking this story? Well, this may sound a little psycho, but I'm not really bothered by the negativity like that. Mm-hmm. In, a, in a way, I enjoy it 
because <clears throat> I, I'm sure you know this, you know, doing what you do. Mm -hmm. But if you're not getting criticized, come if, on, now. if you're not getting any sort of negative energy, you're, you're not good at what you no, do you in, in, the, in this industry. You're just not. So part of me felt a little bit complimented, actually. But, you know, just just don't entertain mm -hmm. the <clears throat> those that just aren't worth it. You know, at the end of the day, it's not personal. They're just. They're mad at the news. They're not mad at you. So, <laughs> well, some of them are mad at you too, though, bro. <laughs> I, I, I guess so. I mean, you, hey, who cares though? For real. I mean, they, but they're 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 more so mad at the news. That is true. In that case, than they are at me. Mm -hmm. Like they they would have been mad at anyone who who ended up breaking that. But I mean, I, I'll I'll say this: I, I took no pleasure in, in doing that. It was just something that we had to do in that moment. Mm -hmm. But yeah. The, I, I didn't really have a super big strategy for handling it besides just, you know, ig it. Ign ignoring it, yeah. playing it cool, you know, mm -hmm. you know, keeping a low profile and just uh, just doing the job I was hired to do. Yeah. Um, you clearly are a historian of, of, of Tiger history. I, I got to give you that for sure, regardless of your age. And another hot button topic the last few weeks has been Penny has said some things that have kind of made people start the conversation of, <clears throat> what are realistic expectations for this program? Like, where do they sit historically and all these type of things? And I'll ask you, you, I'm sure I can go back in history with you, whether you saw it live or you didn't see it live, but things that, that you definitely have knowledge of. What do you think realistic expectations for this program should be? Uh, I think it should be a program that not only makes the NCAA tournament pretty regularly, mm -hmm. but is a at least a regular contender for second weekends because mm -hmm. that's what this program has done historically. And with the NIL era, Memphis has more resources and ability to get players in here than ever before. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people realize right now. Like, the resources that Memphis has in basketball, mm. ridiculous. Like, ridiculous. There's no excuse that they should be missing the NCAA tournament. Mm. That's why this year is just so absurd. Because, like, this team was easily the most talented Penny's ever had. Mm. It's obviously not the best. <laughs> we saw that on the court. <laughs> right. But it was easily the most talented. And there's no way that team should have had any business l missing the NCAA tournament, much less losing to a terrible Wichita State team <laughs> to open the American Athletic Conference tournament. Kenny and I were obviously down there in Fort Worth for the game. And when we were walking out of Dickey's Arena that night, we were just like, we really not coming back tomorrow we really driving all the way back to memphis tomorrow <laughs> the same day because these uh -huh. dudes just lost to the shockers <laughs> hey, the these, 14 and shockers, 18 man. shockers in their first aac tournament game like to set the expectations first off that should not happen mm -hmm. that's below rock bottom mm -hmm. like that, that just can't ever happen but in terms of the again the resources and the culture and the history of this program it should be making the NCAA tournament almost every season, and it should be a regular contender for the the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, maybe even the Final Four in really good years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in football, there's definitely a valid point of, hey, the resources are a bit more limited in terms mm -hmm. of things you can do. And there's 55 so, dudes you got to... Yeah, so if you go 6-6 yeah. six and six one year, that's mm -hmm. obviously not great, but it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Like The basketball program, it has the ability to snag players from a school like Alabama like it did with Javon Quinn early this mm -hmm, year. Mm -hmm. It has the ability to outbid Kentucky for somebody like David Jones. Mm -hmm. Has the ability to get Jake Juan Walton. Has the ability to get Jordan Brown. Like all, all these guys that were top dollar NIL prospects, especially yeah. considering how late Memphis got them in the cycle. So it, you, you got to find a way to be a more consistent winner and winning at a high level. Yeah. Like you, you, you can't be finishing fifth in the AAC. Yeah, you, I, I you, think you can't be missing the fair. tournament. <laughs> I think I that's mean, pretty fair for sure. Uh, pe people will say, like, what are you talking about when I say this? But this program really should be in a position where it's above going to the NIT. Really yeah. should be. Mm -hmm. Like, th this program has no business, you know, being in danger of going to the NIT every year. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be on the bubble. Shouldn't be in that position at all. Uh, and, of course, the the expectations, you know, vary in the present day because of where the program is right now. I mean, next yeah. season, if we're talking next season, it's NCAA tournament or bust. I think before then, 
you were having second weekend discussions because you were coming off of two tournament appearances in a row Mm -hmm. where you got super close to making the second weekend both times in 2022. You just ran into the number one overall seed in Gonzaga. Mm -hmm. You were up by 10 on them at halftime, but you know, Duran and Williams got into major foul trouble in that game and Mm -hmm. Drew Timmy just kind of took over. And then FAU, that's a game that Memphis should have won, but the jump ball call came into play and plus they just weren't at their best that night. So when you're coming off of two years in a row, where you just got super close, yet second weekend expectations were not only, you know, reasonable, but they were, they were kind of a realistic expectation yeah. there. Well, you you talked about David Jones, and you talked about the resources we have. Um, you know, if you get if there's been the kind of some kind of murmurings about he may come back, and with NIL stuff being a factor, yeah, you get guys to stay longer. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, do you think that's a real thing? Like there's a real opportunity you can see David Jones back? And also, do you think that could be maybe a detriment to his overall career if he comes back to play another season of college basketball, knowing that he ultimately wants to be an NBA player at Utah? Well, to answer the second half of your question <clears throat> first, I don't think David Jones is ready for the NBA yet. Mm, okay. I don't think he's good enough defensively. I think he needs to be a better ball handler. I think he needs to calm down on the turnover problem. I think David Jones is, well, as talented as as good of a college player as he is, still has very obvious glaring holes in his game that could get exposed real quick on the professional level. Mm-hmm. So because of that, I'm not sure he's ready for the NBA right now. And because of that, I doubt he finds himself in a position to where he gets drafted. And because of that, I think a return to Memphis is quite likely, assuming that they're able to gather up the resources next necessary, which as we just laid out a second ago, mm. shouldn't be incredibly difficult. Um, in terms of when we'll know if David, you know, David Jones is back or not, that's going to be a real stretched out elongated process. He's going to go through the draft. He's going to test the waters. He's going to do uh, what we've seen Deandre Williams do before mm. what we've seen Lester Quinones do before mm. what we've seen Kendrick Davis do before. It's going to be probably until late May or early June where we know for sure if David Jones is back or not. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be – I think if you get him back, you can really build around it. Yes. I just hope you get an earlier decision so you can kind of know how you build your team. Well, that's the yeah. that's the preferable thing, but yeah. that's just not a realistic ex- expectation considering the era that we're in right now. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean the, these guys have every right and every opportunity to, you know, explore the waters yep. and – See what kind of professional opportunities. So he's going to stretch there. it out. Yeah, yeah, he's going to stretch it out. I imagine mm-hmm. to again the late May, early June, whenever that NBA draft withdrawal deadline is. Mm-hmm. I haven't exactly uh, checked to see when that's going to be, but uh, I would guess that he's going to wait pretty close. Yeah. To uh, to then. Right. To you know make an official decision there, and that's where this gets a little bit complicated for Penny and Memphis, right? Because we 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 saw a similar situation two years ago with both. DeAndre and Lester. Yeah. And those were two guys that Penny was really banking on coming back, right? Mm-hmm. And he got DeAndre back, but he didn't get Lester. Mm-hmm. And because he didn't get Lester back, he had to pivot real quick. He got Emmanuel Acott, yeah. got Keontae Kennedy, and then Acott just takes off on the first day of classes, if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. So all of a sudden, you're stuck without a With real nothing. starting three. Mm-hmm. And and you don't want to end up in that situation again, yeah. obviously. But, but that's the game you got to play. But, but at yeah. the same time, if you get another high-level score on the wing to hypothetically replace David Jones, and then David Jones decides to come back, there you have a whole other issue, right? Yeah. Because now David Jones could be upset. That could create, you know, chemistry issues mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. We so don't need it, those. It, Sounds it, familiar. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's, it's a real complicated process, and I, I don't envy Penny's position at all there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to put you in Penny's position. My last question for you, this is Roman Clear, of course. Tiger B writer for uh, Bluff City Media. I'm going to put you in Penny's position. With, with with the resources you have, not knowing David Jones' uncertainty, uh, people want local guys. They want guys who are playing for the city and all Trust those types of things. they don't want local guys right now. Because <laughs> you got – with Curtis Givens and Billy Richmond both off the board. Uh, who do you want? I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to – I don't want to be mean, uh, but the, the local talent here in Memphis right now isn't good enough to play at this program. Yeah, just as and, a, I, and so. I agree. And I think people – they're, they're talking all this stuff about you want local kids, but okay, go Unless get you can flip Curtis Givens or Billy Richmond or Memphis. somehow get Cam Jones to transfer over, yeah. which is obviously unlikely, uh, no Memphis kid should be on next yeah. year's team. But with that being said, um, how would you build this team next year? I'm not going to say names, but like what type of guys 
Would you get? Would you try to? How would you build this team if you were Penny Hardaway? What kind of guys would you go after? Well, obviously, the number one priority is getting Jones back. Mm -hmm. And again, assuming that he doesn't find himself in a real position to where he's able to get drafted, you're going to assume that he comes back, and you're just going to do whatever it takes on the NIL side, NIL side to get that done. So you have Jones back, you have Nick Jordan back, mm -hmm. you have a solid recruit from high, from the high school ranks in Jared Harris that I think can be a solid contributor. He's a, he's going to be an energy guy, you know, someone who can come in and contribute athletically and defensively and all that. But obviously you still have a bunch of other scholarships left to fill. So obviously you need to get a high caliber five, someone who can, you know, run run the floor, protect the rim, you know, score efficiently. You don't want the Jordan Brown mold. Does obviously. anybody know who the the Lou Henson Award winner is from this pet this year? <laughs> uh, whoever it is, Memphis probably Stay doesn't away, want him. Yo. Memphis Stay probably away from don't him, want him. Right? Memphis probably don't want him. Mm. <laughs> but you basically want the opposite of Jordan Brown at center. Mm. And for a point guard, I don't think you really necessarily need a defensive glue guy there. Mm -hmm. But you want someone who's going to give effort. Yeah. You want someone who's going to at least be you know, be a challenge for whoever he's guarding on the defensive side, at least be kind of a pest and be able to mm -hmm. run and tire him out if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And offensively, you, you just want that guy to be able to score, facilitate, create for both himself and others, which there's going to be a myriad of guys in the portal who can do that this year. Mm -hmm. So Memphis should have no real issue finding out who that guy is. Yeah. And you want defenders next to Jones on the wing because Jones is obviously a defensive liability. So you want guys there who are going to be able to make up for that. Yeah. And if you're able to get uh, a couple stars to surround Jones and then fill the rest of the roster out with solid role guys, you know, shooters and, def and you know, specialty defenders and things like that, you should be able to field a pretty solid team in 2024-25. I've always kind of made jokes about Penny getting together his AAC Avengers every offseason, right? Where he kind of goes. That's not, the, that's not the worst option. Right. So <laughs> do you think this could possibly – because he does it every year. He gets multiple guys from the conference – that 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 uh, the handshake line, man. Penny just the handshake line. That's a legit thing, <laughs> man. Whisper sweet yeah, nothing man. to these yeah. guys' ears, man. Hey, he so. had David doing it this year mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I mean, there's so already any guys. Uh, I don't want to name names. I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah. There are some certain things on that end that I, I can't speak on as yeah. of now. Hey, hey, but you know, hey, you hear him, <laughs> him. Hey, you hear him, don't. Hey. But but it, Memphis will likely be in contact with at least a few names that fans have become pretty familiar with this That's year. I'll say that. About. That's what I'm talking about for sure. Yeah. This is my man, Roman Cleary, man. I'm telling you, this is my guy, hey, man. Thanks for having me on, man. This is my guy this for been, sure. This has been good. Oh, yeah, for sure. Got to get you back out here again, man. Yeah, my man, sure. Roman Cleary. Anytime. Tiger Basketball beat writer for Bluff City Media. About to take a break. When we come back, what are we doing? The three-pointer on the Edge of the Saints show. we see you guys in a minute. TJ, before we get started, I want you to give a pat to Trey on his back. He needs it right now. I need you to give him a hug. Trey already man started. Is down bad. Real bad. Trey is down. Welcome to the show. Trey is down so bad right now. <laughs> I was about 350 yards away from the studio and was pulled over by a Shelby County Sheriff and given a hands-free device ticket. I'm not getting points on my right. Right now, I have three points. I've scored three points tonight, and that is three more points than Jordan Brown scored in 10 minutes the other day. <laughs> savage, dude. <laughs> savage. As my premiums of insurance are going to go up by 50 to 100%, possibly. Yeah, but I will be going to 201 on May the 20th or whatever, 24th at uh, 1 30 p.m. I have zero faith in that actually working in your favor. I have gone to court multiple times to fight a ticket, and literally me just showing up gets it dismissed. Mm, that, that is going to be there waiting on you, for sure. Tune in to Tigers Untapped with TJ Willis and Trey Lasley every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. The AAC tournament further highlights how deep the problems right. went with the team this year. It still felt like until the la until the FAU game and then this ensuing game, so really the last week, week and a half, that if this team's back is up against the wall, they can still flip that switch and perform because they still have that talent level. <laughs> no. 
When you think they have it, they don't have it. Yeah. When you think they're bottomed out, seemingly they're not all the way done. Like they still have a, a little bit of a push to give you, but can they sustain that? No, they never no. could. No. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll tell you the most egregious thing to me about it is you have all these veterans that have been in, you know, conference tournament atmospheres, NCAA tournament atmospheres, and they just didn't show up. I, I think I probably speak for the vast majority of Memphis fan bases. Thank you. God, this season is over. Tune in to On the Bluff with Christian Fowler and Gabe Kuhn every Tuesday at 12 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. All right, y'all, welcome back to the Anthony Sane Show. Shout out again to my man, Roman Cleary, man. Great interview with my boy, man. I knew he was going to come in and do his thing, man. Roman Cleary uh, in the building, man. Big time, big time uh, Roman Cleary was in the building. Big time, bright future for that Oh, yeah, kid, for man. sure, man. Kid's 19. Got ex- G.G. Jackson of Bluff City Media, so to speak, man. Youngest media member in Memphis. In the city, in the world, man. In the world. <laughs> in the world. Now, uh, uh, what's my kid? We just uh, got to make sure we keep him out the shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Only only, only uh, J.J. Metz is uh, <laughs> 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 Little JJ. Little JJ. FAU uh, beat writer. JJ Metz for Florida Atlantic. Poor JJ when Dusty May get his ass up out of there. What, what's he gonna, what, what are they going to do? What's the kids going to do, man? His whole identity is going to be gone, oh, man. man. What's he going to do? The whole thing over, just like that. Uh, but the three pointer, man, we've talked about three things going on uh, in the world of sports, man. Uh, we talked about uh, the whole Gigi Jackson situation as far as being one of the wings. That could be your starting three uh, next year for the Memphis Grizzlies. Can I just say one thing mm-hmm. real quick, just to kind of book in that for me? Yeah. I know we're here sitting here talking about starters and rotations and all that kind of stuff with Gigi. There, it is undeniable how good he is. Oh yeah, for sure. Don't, it, bro. It's scary, and I talk about that on Twitter as well. A lot of fans are still trying to like, like uh, taper their their. their their expectations off and let's just, just wait. Let's, no, man. Like, no, dude. That dude is good. Like, he's a good player, man. Like, it just isn't Troy Williams. You know what I mean? Like, this is, like, this kid can play, man. And, like, it's obvious that he's a good player. Let's be frank. It ain't even OJ Mayo. Nah. This, guy, this kid can flat foot play. And, like, there's, it was a guy that was in a conversation with me and Chris. He was like, well, uh, he said, y'all are just kind of, y'all are rushing it. Like, he's, what's the difference between him and, like, uh, 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 um, Trey Murphy or Herb Jones? Stop it. I say, man, those dudes, like, Gigi has been that dude, man. He made a bad college decision that really messed up his trajectory, messed his whole, like, where he is now. Reclassifying. Yeah, like, it was a horrible decision to do that. Like, he should have stayed in the school. Signed to North Carolina. Yeah, he should have went to North Carolina. Decommitted and went to South, <laughs> South Carolina, Carolina. yeah. Because South Carolina wanted him then. And if North Carolina was on this, if he was on this North Carolina team right now, he would be uh, the top best. five. We'll be, we'll be like I said last show. Right, we'll be looking at the at the tankathon. Like, man, I hope Gigi Jackson. I hope falls we get to, Gigi. Hope Can we, we get, get Gigi, Gigi Jackson. That'll be a perfect dude for this team, right? Hundred percent. That's what we'll be saying. And um, like I said, he left early, and we got him on this team, and I'm excited about it. I don't care. And one dude was like, "Well, how good could he be? You guys weren't even playing him for the first twenty uh, for the first twenty games, and and if John never here, he wouldn't be playing at all. I don't. Hey." And oh, so what? What's the point? And you know what I mean? Like that's the way the NBA works. Sometimes the cookie man. crumbles. Sometimes, bro. Draymond Green would not be Draymond Green if if David Lee didn't get hurt. Right. Like David Lee getting hurt, like made him a starter, and he was a perfect fit. Like, Tom that, Brady wouldn't be who Tom Brady yeah, is without Drew Brees. That shifted hurt. Steve Kerr's whole career. You know what I mean? To that Draymond Green getting into that starting lineup with those Come guys. Come on, man. Shifted everything. So I mean, who cares? That's just the way it, it turned out. Uh, but speaking of such, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> Heaping praise by Chris Paul, one of the okay. This was so tough for me. Keep yeah, going. I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Keep oh, I've been. I know you're probably about to go. I've been over the whole Hayden Chris Paul thing. Really? Yeah, I've been over that. Can't stand that dude. When I saw, uh, when I saw him go, the the way he handled himself as a professional with, with Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, City Thunder. Yep. And getting that team to the playoffs, it cha- it made me root for Chris Paul. The great, probably one of the best point guards in the history of the yep. NBA. Yep, I still can't stand, dude. <laughs> oh, he's a hateable dude now because uh, when he went to was it Phoenix, I think, or was it Houston? You remember that he we played against, uh, and he was really giving Zaire a hard time. Man. You remember that game? Yes. <laughs> when he was like uh, flopping, and it was he was like really on some other stuff against Zaire. I think he played for, I think he was with Houston still that year. It might have been Phoenix. I'm not sure. But yeah, uh, Chris Paul had 
tons of praise for for uh, Gigi. Dare I say, it was super dope. It was crazy. Dare I say, he got kind of emotional talking he did. about Gigi. He did get emotional, and, and, and that's one of those things that kind of like reminded him of his own. NBA mortality, right? Yeah. Like he's like, man, this is a kid that was on my AAU team. I coached him two years ago. Yeah, and now he's in the league. Dropped thirty five points, career high. Dropped my ass off from three. Mugs calling him coach on the court. Right. <laughs> on the like, court, yeah. NBA players calling him coach on the court. That's yeah. Wild. And then he, he's probably thinking about, man, I had, I impacted that kid's life in some type of way. And then John Morant came in and said, yeah, that's two South Carolina players that you've impacted. That was life. a that was a. Um, I've never heard Josh say anything about CP like that. That was wild. Yeah, it was the it, fact that Josh quote tweeted that and came out and said that. Mm -hmm. It 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 unfroze my heart just a little bit towards Chris Paul. I ain't gonna lie to you, man. Yeah, I it mean, really did. Cause man, Josh don't care nothing about no. He don't know nothing about no Grizzlies Clippers rivalry. He don't, I heard that Josh used to come watch Grizzlies games. I heard that. But he's like he it's CP three bro like he don't he don't have no he don't feel no way about him. He's one of the best point guards he's ever seen. And if you and and, and part of the the, the John ja Morant DNA package when they made John ja the laboratory, there was some CP three spliced in there. You know what I mean? So um, I definitely understand that whole thing. But the things he said about Gigi and then for Draymond Green again to speak uh, very well of Gigi again, um, just just a great a great moment you know, last night after that game. Like I said, G.G. Jackson, 35 points, career high, in a losing effort against the Golden State Warriors, a team who, um, yeah, they're, they're – it seems like ever since Dylan is gone, like yeah. they, they look at the Grizzlies like they're little brothers now. Did you see that, though? Did <laughs> yeah. you see that yesterday with the whole thing with Draymond Asante – um, and then Dez and him kind of got into it at mm. center court, knocked over. It didn't look as goofy as, it, it, it had, as, as that type of stuff has looked in the past. Well, and really. you looked at De Dez. You could tell Dez was trying to calm it down. Yeah, come on, OG, chill out. Right. Yeah. The heat yeah. was not there the way it has been in the past. And our fans, man, just bitch about so much stuff. God, like, that was, that was that was basketball, bro. Like, those two guys – and Santi be on some bullshit too now, Santi's bro. on some bullshit. Yeah, Santi be on some bullshit, bro. Yes. And then when, when dudes like clap back on Santi, then they look at him like he's a victim. Like, no, nah, Santi be, Santi's a common denominator to a lot of bullshit. A lot of it. <laughs> the last two years, man. So that was really nothing to me. It was funny as hell to see uh, Taylor. Taylor Jenkins get his ass <laughs> mowed over. Look like something you see on wrestling. When the ref <laughs> get knocked out. Look like when the ref, you know, like the ref gets, somebody just literally bumps into the ref and he's down for 10 minutes. You know what I mean? <laughs> That was it looked like with Taylor Jenkins for sure. But yeah, man. <laughs> Number two, man, Coach Prime just doing some Coach Prime type shit. Interesting information came out about uh Coach Deion Sanders uh out there in Boulder with Co with the Colorado Buffaloes, man. Said that he has not made a recruiting visit ever <laughs> since he's been there. I mean, honestly, <laughs> Bruh, that's you call wild. bullshit on that, right? Bro, <laughs> they said he has a two hundred thousand dollar budget for for travel. He has not spent a dollar ever. Like how do you do you believe I, that? In today's era, I do not doubt that, man. Has he visited Gabe yet? No, he hadn't. Well, maybe he's But he might be in Gabe DM. So he recruits through DM is what you're saying. He recruits through social media. Like and he's Coach Prime. Like if he got some money for you, he's like, hey man, let's talk. I think I think those days might be over, bro. I think the days of like sitting in the kids' living room with his mom and uh, yeah. wait, will you loaf. trust me? Will you trust me? And eat meatloaf. Kick, you know what I mean? Yeah. And will, will, will you will you be a father figure for my son? And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Are, are you a man of God? Like I think those days are over, bro. I think it's <laughs> all about the bag, man. Yeah, for for your lower level dudes, yeah, you might still be doing that to an extent, but for your big dogs, I think the, the living room meeting day is over, man. I think you're just talking money at this point. Like I don't. You know, speaking of father figure, not to totally change subjects, uh -huh. but did you see that uh, that clip of LeBron and Bob Costas going around the internet mm -mm. the last couple of days? No, when LeBron was 18 years old, rookie in the NBA, mm -hmm. going to Cleveland. Paul Silas was the head coach, and uh, Bob Costas brings up, you know, your father's out of your life. You don't have a father in your life, mm -hmm. LeBron. Uh, do you look at Paul Silas as a father figure? LeBron, sir. It's like. It's my coach, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. But they just they just try to get it, they just try to get black black men, black boys, daddy so bad, bro. Wow. It don't make no sense, man. But no, nah, but yeah, I, I I think I I think I've seen that before. Oh, it's been around for a while. Yeah, I had to go, just, I had to go, yeah. It just made it circles again and I was like, what the yeah. hell? <laughs> like, yeah, man. They love trying to throw throw a throw a dad on a brother, man, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um <laughs> Yeah, for sure. But number three, man, um, Interesting news that happened today as we were getting ready to set up to record. Found out that the G League Ignite is ending, right? Wild. Um, I, we was like, why? I said, well, well, we'll record the show, and by the time we get done the first two segments, we'll find out more about it. <laughs> and we looked at it over the break, and we saw that um, 
it's kind of strategic. And I kind of yeah, like if, if, I do. if they're going in the direction I think they're going in the G League. Because we were like, ah, uh, NIL just got G, the G League Ignite out of here. Because I'll just tell you a timeline. When the G League Ignite stuff happened, I was dope. I was hyped about it. I was like, man, screw this is the end of the NCAA, man. Like, the top players in college basketball, the, at least 10 or 12 of them are going to go play for this G League team, get real money. And they're gonna. That's gonna be the end of the NCAA, right? And has, the NCAA thought that too, right? And 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 they reacted and they said, "Screw it, we're gonna make this deal with the devil and open up this NIL thing." Because they had to, right? Because they, they saw that happening, right? Yep. And so then when that happened, uh, NIL has been you know kind of nutty, been kind of crazy. People have been responding to that. It got all, it got a lot of coaches to there's retire. A lot of float, there's a lot of money floating around. In yeah, the a lot NIL, of coaches man. giving, uh, quitting, and all that type of stuff. Man. Going to Congress and talking yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, all that, right? So not the way it used to be, Anthony. Right, right. You used to have more control of these used boys. To, I used to be able to used to be able to tell them that you got to do what I said. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Back in my day. Yeah, uh, exactly. So all those, all you know, that happened, right? And so now. I, when I first saw the story, I was like, oh, shit, NIL just got uh, G League Ignite up out of here, right? And then you read more about it, and we read it, and I was like, oh, okay, I see what the NBA may be doing. And I, I don't I'm, – I'm, more news might come out by the time this records and comes out, but it feels like it's one of those things like where let's make the G League a true farm system. Right, where right. Not, not only do you have three two-way contracts, but you can have rights to, to your whole team. To your whole team. right. Kind of like in baseball, right? There's a farm system in right. baseball. There's double A, tri- single A, triple A, right. or single A, double A, triple A. There's farm clubs, mm-hmm. things like that. That that's exactly what the G League Ignite was created to be. Was yep. created to target specific players in high school that were top level that that could make some money and learn how to play professionally at the same time, right. get them ready for the NBA. And it's clear that I think the NBA. The G League and I had struggled to compete in the G League in the G League standings, but mm-hmm. I think they recognized we could turn this whole thing into a farm system and get a bunch of kids ready. Yep, <clears throat> yep. And right now you've got roughly 480 players in the NBA. Right? If you can almost if you can double that basically, yeah, and make it where it's almost a thousand dudes, that could be a strike at the NCAA because you might have guys who say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and go this route, and I'll be I could be less secure on this where I'm attached to an NBA team. Instead of staying for that NIL deal, you might go for – you might go ahead and go pro, not get drafted. No, you're not going to get drafted. It's like I'll just kind of – I'll do this G League route, and the G League could be real money because I'm getting real money from the Memphis Grizzlies. And well, the from, question is, is are those mm-hmm. contracts going to be guaranteed? Like what's up with – Yeah, the, I what? just want – I wonder what they got up their sleeve, man. I don't, I don't think the NBA is taking a, a They're loss. They're taking a step back. <clears throat> yeah. This doesn't feel like a step back yeah. to me. This feels like a a – kind of cutting of the fat to kind of yeah. implement a new system, which will be very interesting to see what they do. Because yeah, obviously man. the Players Association has to be involved in all those conversations. It'll be – I think we're in for a pretty interesting time during as they're trying to figure out what yeah. this like G League situation looks like. And, and instead of a guy – because the whole David Jones thing, we'll, we'll this is a, a segment all to itself. I talked about this a little bit with Roman as well. But with the whole David Jones thing, like if – just a guy like him, right? Who's a guy who's you know third or fourth year college player, right? You got good. You assume he got crazy money nil wise, right? Do you take another year of that, or do do you realize okay maybe this is going to make me, maybe this seals my career? You know what I mean? Like if I take if I stay in college another year and I take this whatever hundred thousand dollars to stay in college, does that end? Does that end my NBA chances if I do this? My earning potential in the NBA, exactly, right? If I stay, if I stay out of that league one 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 more year, does that bother? Me? Does that hurt me? As opposed to whatever the G League may be about to do now, <clears throat> where you can go go ahead and go, and you'll be making similar money from your G League deal, but you're actually in the NBA system and you're not, you know, some twenty five year old kid playing college. You know what I mean? I just so think we'll the NBA. See, man. I think we'll the see. NBA is changing in that regard, Anthony. I think I think a few years ago. It was a very top-heavy, superstar-driven league. Mm-hmm. And I think you're starting to see, especially with teams like Denver Nuggets. Role teams players like, have value. Role players have value. And, and cheap so, contracts have value. Right. And so – Because the CBA is set up now where you can't have these four or five monster deals. Right. It's, it's going to be hard for the Grizzlies to keep their dudes, man. It's going to be really hard to, to keep them under this this new CBA. A thousand percent. Mm-hmm. Especially if, if all four of these guys that we're talking about become what we think they can become. Right. It's going to be impossible for them right. to. And right. so it's like – I just think – we're just—it's a changing landscape mm-hmm. around basketball as a whole in terms of yep. guys that 
you, you know, a lot of times the narrative a few years ago was if you're not in the league within one or two years of being out of high school, then you probably don't have a future in the NBA. Yeah, and I think changing. that that's changed. Mm -hmm. Your older guys are getting getting looks now. Yeah. Especially when you got a guy, because you think about it, man, the way the guy, the way the teams want these cheap deals, those are the guys who are coming a little bit more NBA ready. Right. If you can get that guy on a rookie deal like that, right. like that's, yeah, if I got a guy that's 24 and I got him for four years. That's that's ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, well, you, and not only that, they, they become, then they become an asset, right? Mm -hmm. those, those become tradable assets yep. that those contracts are used to, you know, fill. And exactly what Brevin talked about mm -hmm. on your show a few months ago, where he talked about, you know, if we're thinking about specifically a team, but if we're thinking about the players as well, those little, those little two to three year role yep. player contracts, <clears throat> you can keep that, that, that logo on your chest mm -hmm. for the, for 10, 15 years and make really good money doing that. You don't bro, have to be the guy. It just came. I know what the NBA slick ass about to do, bro. Adam Silver ass is not slick, bro. Man, this dude be playing chess out here, man. You remember what it was this year or last year? They talked about adding a third round to the NBA draft. You remember what I'm saying? That, I don't remember that, no. You know they're talking about making it two days, though, right? Yeah. Man, this dude is not slick, bro. That third round is about to be your, like. A G League? Your G League supplemental dude's Jeez. draft. Yeah, man. Is it, it a draft for players in the G League, G League now or coming into the G League? It's probably about to be a, a like a, guys who are mostly going to be like two way deals and guys that you have those retention deals in the G League for. That's wild. That's I think that's about to happen, bro. Man, I, man, NBA like, and they made a they made an investment on the WNBA a long time ago that was hemorrhaging. That shit is about to blow up. Yes, for that, if you look at bro, because we we talked about the NCAA tournament, we didn't mention the ladies. The women's bracket got way more star power than the, than the guys do, bro. Like as far as like those, uh, do you call do you call a woman an alpha? Hell yeah. yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, you yeah you got you got a lot love you got a lot of like big name like alphas in alphas that in, in that tournament as opposed to some of the stuff you're seeing on the guys side, man. But like I said, I hope I hope that what they're doing. Kind of get stuff back in balance, man. Because it's, it's, I'm not really a fan of seeing what the NBA, what the college basketball climate is with these guys who are like who used to go go pro or used to kind of like fade out of the college basketball. Those guys still being around. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I, I know it's probably kind of backwards, but I kind of like it the old way, bro. I like it when you lost dudes because they just said, "All right, man, I'm about to just go all overseas." Right, all right, Nick Saban. <laughs> Are calling you. I'm not saying that, bro. I'm not, you, Nick Saban. Over I'm here. Not, uh, Nick Saban. No, <laughs> I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the old way. Like back in my day. No, I just um, like older dudes being in college basketball and like being like basically pros. I'm not really a fan of it. Like, mm. you know what I mean? Go take take your ass to Lithuania. Or something. Like I don't. I don't know. I feel you. It's kind of like a, a guy like um, what's that dude? Well, they don't come in here and play for the city, man. When they do Stop, that. man. Be quiet. Oh, my bad. What's, my bad. what's the dude? I'm trying to think of somebody who, what's that kid's name, man? Tall, light-skinned kid. He came in Calipari's area. He's a big man. He was coaching high school here somewhere. Oh, Sean Taggart. Yeah, like a Sean Coach, Taggart, right? Coach of Carnival. You remember Sean Taggart left Memphis. He was like, I'm, I'm just, he's like, I'm just kind of done with college basketball. I'm going to see what overseas has got going on. Yeah. Like, Sean Taggart would have played, like, six years in Memphis <laughs> in, in today's climate, man. You know Tra what I mean? And then transfer somebody else to one more in some yeah, COVID year or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's like. I kind of miss that element of it where dudes kind of like, all right, man, I've, I've done this two years, two or three years. I ain't going to the NBA. I'm not an NBA player, but I'm kind of done with college, man. Let me just go see what life is like. I don't – like I don't want to see Emmanuel Acott's ugly ass. Uh, is man, that, nice. that his name? Yeah, man. In nice. North Carolina? Emmanuel Acott. Uh, no, Armando Baycott. Yeah, him. Yeah, I don't want to see that. Emmanuel funeral. Acott was actually yeah. on the Memphis campus <laughs> yeah, exactly, last yeah. year. Yeah. I, I don't want to see the dude, the dude like Isaac Simpson. I don't want to see that dude. <laughs> I don't want to see this dude in college basketball ten years, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm over, I'm over. I all do that. think, I do think the NBA is reacting strongly to this NIL situation. Mm -hmm. They're gonna, it's gonna swing that pendulum back a little bit, and I think we're gonna start seeing over the next couple of years that the the college basketball landscape of transfer <laughs> portal slash NIL stuff. It's going to slow down. It's going to even itself out. I think. Yep. I don't think. It, I don't think it can stay at this pace right now. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to slow down for sure. And I think, I think that there is value. There's going to be an arms race for those middling guys, like for those dudes, like that. like for those guys who aren't quite pros, 
but they're professional. They shouldn't be playing college basketball. Some dudes just want to be professional. Lester yeah. Quinones is a perfect yeah. example of that. Yeah. Right? And people are like, man, Lester could have stayed in Memphis and did this. Yeah, I think Lester did done. that. And I think if he had did that, he would not be in the NBA. I think if he had did that, it would have it messed it would have messed up his trajectory. And look, now he's got a guaranteed contract mm -hmm. with Gold State Warriors. Yep, timing matters, man. Like everything, all that everything. stuff matters. Yeah, and and shout out to Lester for doing the way he did it for sure. But yeah, man, we're about to take a break. When we come back, inside the same brain, man, might get a little serious. It got some of the most Memphis shit ever happened in the city of Memphis on Wednesday night, man. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely want to talk about that when we come back here on Enter the Same Show. See you guys in a minute. Two bits of introspection besides all the nonsense that he was saying. Because yeah. he did, oh, we had the greatest plans ever. You know, they just didn't execute. It's right. like, well, it's your job to make them execute. Yeah. And then uh, uh, he said something about, uh, you know, what went wrong? Somebody said, what went wrong this year? And he said, well, I don't know. And then he's like asking the players. He's like, do you, do you want me to ask him? What went wrong? And they're yeah. like, I don't know. That You need to know that. If you want to be successful going into the future, you need to know the answer to that question. For sure. The problem I have with Penny and like the words he says... A lot of those words never actually amount to action. I know he said he thinks he's done a great job and all these, he's had these type of messages where he feels like he's being a little bit victimized. I just, all I can do is hope that he uses this as a springboard and a learning, a learning tool, tool going, going forward. forward. But do I believe that to be the case? No, probably not. Right. Tune in to On the Bluff with Christian Fowler and Gabe Kuhn every Tuesday at 12 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. Everybody that's a fan of this basketball team, this city, this university wants nothing more than him to be the most successful coach we've ever had. Yes, because we'd be winning games. And that's all I want is to win games. Started 15 and 2. Everything was beautiful. Top 10, and then you go seven and eight down the stretch. Like, in terms of winning and losing, like, I think he's earned himself a bad year, right? I don't think anybody complained about the results of last year. Like, everybody was pretty presently surprised. I mean, outside of the fact that you were on the eight nine seed line, like, sure. that was frustrating. But I think everybody was relatively happy winning the conference tournament, beating the number one team in the country. I mean, you're a blown call away from making the Sweet 16. I had no complaints about last year, especially about I last think year. being last year going into it, everybody thinking, oh, this isn't an IT team like this team's not they're not built to to make a run or even make the tournament. Sure. Tune in to Tigers Untapped with TJ Willis and Trey Lasley every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the Bluff City Media YouTube channel. y'all welcome back to the final segment of the show inside the same brain uh yeah man good stuff so far today man roman cleary just tr tremendous story from him man uh sharing his story of, of adversity bro from coming from <laughs> from being a middle school offensive lineman to uh <laughs> tiger basketball b rider for sure man i definitely can relate because you know yeah i tried to play sports and stuff at school but as soon as the uh the nil deals came out there when, when jobs <laughs> Man, man, I started when I got my first paycheck. I was like, "Yeah, no, nah, I yeah. think I'm good on sports, man." Yeah. Man, so uh, yeah, shout out to Roman Cleary for sure. Um, true, true historian and student of the game, and you can tell he does his homework. It's wild at 19 years old. That he, he knows, knows all this stuff. that much stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah, man, because he's he's definitely done the homework for sure, man. But it's time for uh, inside the same brain, man, where I talk about something. It doesn't have anything to do with sports. And I love when these stories are local, man. I love when I can touch on something that's happening in the city of Memphis. And I know you love this story. Wild <laughs> times. But I had so many emotions uh, for the last few weeks about this particular situation with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, who was coming to the University of Memphis to speak. And when you see the initial flyer or the online thing, the Twitter flyer thing for it or whatever, and you kind of put yourself in your mind, he's like, man, it's going to be – all these people are just going to be crowding the campus to see this kid, right? Like this, and you see all these people who have whatever viewpoint to see this kid, right? Right. But then you think about it, in reality, ain't nobody going to be at this shit, man. Like nobody, shit. you know, um, that type of thing. 
And there's been all this anger about it. I had my initial angers about it. I talked about it on Jason and John's show. And I said some things that kind of ruffled some people's feathers. And I said, they were talking about, well, you know, freedom of speech. And I said, well, there's really no such thing as freedom of speech in America. I think there's an overrated term. And I still think that's an overrated term. I don't, I don't think that's not true at all. I don't think that that's true at all, that, that, that there is true freedom of speech, right? Because with, with freedom of speech, there's two reasons why I said it. With freedom of speech, man, first of all, um, your, your, <laughs> what you can get away with and what I can get away with might not be the same thing. So it's not true freedom. There are certain liberties you have in speech, but it's not equal. Like you can't, um, everybody doesn't have the same rights when it comes down to freedom of speech. I right? think that's true. Yes. And number two, yes, there is freedom of speech, but your rights also ends where, where mine begin. And if, if you're, you're, you, you have freedom of speech, but you just can't go out and say things that offend people. Or Inflammatory. Put people, yeah, those type of things. So it's not really true freedom of speech, right? You're, you don't have to... You just can't, and, and, and there's no such thing as, as being able to say what you want to say without consequences and repercussions. Absolutely. Kyrie Irving had all right in the world to say the things he said that were viewed to be anti-Semitic a year or so ago, and he dealt with the consequences of that. He lost endorsements. Kanye West, same type of thing, right? And, you know, you can, yeah, there's freedom of speech, but there are consequences to it, so it's not really freedom. You know, <laughs> it's not like you can just do whatever without any repercussion. Right? So that's why I question that whole concept. But, uh, man, do I ever stand on it for what I saw last night. Man. <laughs> uh, just some good old American kids uh, exercising the, the liberty of, of free speech in America, man, <laughs> uh, at the University of Memphis. The most Memphis way possible, bro. Uh, and when I started actually, I saw the, the protest. And it's so wild because people, the same people that are crying about, oh, the kid has freedom of speech, you know, and you can't stop this organization for bringing this kid here, right? No, you can't. And you also can't control who comes to the event. You, you, but you also cannot control how they respond. How they respond. Like, yep. they have the right to say, dude, we don't want you here. Yep. And we don't want to hear what you have to say. And that happened. And that happened. And it was glorious. And it was, it was in the most Memphis way possible. A bunch of ur urban youth in the city of Memphis uh, voiced their opinion. And they, they did it the perfect way, man. We talked about this a little bit off the air with this whole subject. And um, you see a lot of people who have taken the stance of the University of Memphis should have stopped this from happening, right? I don't, I don't really care. At, at the time, I was really upset about it. I was like, the University of Memphis should stop this. They should stop this from coming to the city. But the way that it went down, man, and I don't want to get emotional thinking about this, but the way that it went down was actually the best way the to best go way. about doing it. 100%. It made me proud to see young people, 19, 20. We talked about Roman and the things he's doing at 19. These young people, man, 19, 20, 21 year old, 18 year old college students, bombarding this event. They weren't, they were talking crazy, but they were talking crazy in the Memphis way. They weren't talking about doing nothing crazy to this dude. They weren't threatening violence towards this man. They basically came in on the United Front and said, We do not want to hear this BS that you're talking about. And and if, and if they never did anything, it probably would have been 10, 15 people there that were actually there to support this, this kid. Absolutely right? true. But these kids came in. Got his ass up out <laughs> Man, was I happy about it, man. Accident man, real questions that he did not want to answer. That he could not Couldn't answer. Couldn't answer without sounding like a racist turd. And it was on his ass. And he got up out of there. And it's so he, funny because everybody does this whole cupcake, crybaby, sensitive. <laughs> everybody, that's the whole thing. You get all these weird. Snowflake. Snowflake, that's the word, yeah. I've been called some of the weird. I, I put a tweet out last night. Because a lot of people, I hate, I don't want to get into the specifics of this, but. I basically said, because people are saying that, you know, um, you know those guys that he killed were like a pedophile and these type of things. I was like, okay, I get all that, man. But, like, this dude ain't Rambo. Like, this ain't the Punisher, bro. <laughs> like, he's not some vigilante who's here to to to, to avenge justice. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's, 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 that's not make him that, bro. And, and that's not. That's not the role of this. And, like, even when you talk about police brutality, that's the thing that people say all the time. Well, that guy was this, and he did this. Uh, well, George Floyd used to do drugs. Yeah, but it's like, man, like, the police's job is not executioner. Yeah. It's to bring him to justice, to bring him to— And he ain't even got a badge. Yeah, and, like, this kid, like— And I understand self-defense. I understand the rules of self-defense. I understand how that works. Right. But this kid got up and said had something that had literally nothing to do with him. Gets up and he travels out of town with a— Gun Overstate on his side. Line. Over state, state line lines. with a gun on his side. Yeah, that's self-defense. But, dude, if I see you walking on me with that, I'm I'm approaching you. Like, okay, what you want? You know what I'm saying? Right. So, and I get the whole thing. He does have the right to self-defense. But I'm more so bothered that he's turned that into 
celebrity. Celebrity. Hate it. In a way for him to be uh, the face of some odd movement. And they, and they call you things, Kenny Stofield, I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> like, somebody called me adult. I was like, all right, I'll write that one down. You're like, that, that maybe, sounds maybe, not, maybe I should be using it. That sounds kind, of, sound kind of dope. Should, let me do my research <laughs> before I decide if I'm going to be pissed off or not. Can we say that on YouTube? <laughs> yeah, can we use you know that mean? word? <laughs> Is Delta okay? Yeah. Right? And I've heard so many weird things that people have said to me, and I, I'm not really standing out in front of this. I've, I've, I've getting my thoughts off about it, but you know there are people who are really you know kind of combating these people. And I just kind of once you say something crazy to me, I block you and I move on. I had some. I woke up to so many last night. I was like, no, nah, I ain't blocking all of y'all, but <laughs> ain't none of y'all said nothing else other than your initial thing, so I ain't got nothing to say. But uh, the highlight of the night, Kenny Stubblefield, oh was in, in every video you see, you hear people say. Oh, he's a killer. He shouldn't be here. Man. Um, you know, you, you, he supports this, this, this. And we're in terms, I don't even know what they're talking about, right? But if you listen in the background <laughs> on every video where these kids are going off, right, you hear somebody checking the shit out of somebody in the background. I love it. <laughs> it was so... <laughs> Do you see that video of the crowd of kids checking that police the officer? The police officer, man. And he loved it. He was loving it. It's Memphis, man. It's Memphis. He, he knows he was there. He was like, man, I'm getting free money. These kids yeah, ain't going to do shit, They ain't going to do shit. They ain't going to do nothing but get that dude a hard time. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, part, there, and I'm there to protect them. That's that's what people that's don't it. understand, man. That's, that's what it. people don't understand. Like, uh, man, I try not to get emotional about stuff. This That wasn't tears. That was tears from the crying, from laughing, not from emotion. But I tried to get emotional. I, I think once I started talking about this, it may take me there. I'm not going to break down crying. I'm on damn show. You're good, good, bro. You're good, bro. But um, you, you I, I, have a, I have a passion for uh, social issues like this, right? So I think that's pretty obvious that I have that passion. But people talk about police at these things and the role of police when they come to protest, the police should be there to protect the protesters, bro, not to protect Kyle Rittenhouse. Those kids weren't going to do nothing to that, man. But you have people like Kyle Rittenhouse who come with machine guns on their side to start shit with protesters. So that's why the police should be there. And people are like, man, they're disrespecting the police. No, man, the police is on, that's their ally. That's not that guy wasn't there to 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 stop them from doing something. And crazy. then checking him showed that. Showed that. That's myth as shit, bro. Like this. That's that term of endearment, you know what I mean? That's classic Memphis shit, bro. To, to, to check the police officer and say the man like he's sweating <laughs> vegetable oil. No, like vegetable oil, it. drinking ass. <laughs> like he drank vegetable oil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody said like he sweat something like he was sweating something, 10W30 or something. Man, say so you don't even want to be out here, man. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Just pure Memphis shit, man. But if Dressed you, in a suit the whole time. <laughs> right. But if you watch uh, the video of the girl that was uh, the heavyset dark girl, and uh, somebody was checking somebody. Like she was saying something. And then somebody was like, hey, man, uh, ugly. Like, I don't know who, I don't know they were checking Kyle Rittenhouse and they were checking somebody, bro. <laughs> but Memphis is just a, a messed up city when it comes down to taking shit serious, bro. Like, we, <laughs> we ain't gonna take nothing serious long, bro. It's go, it's some check and go, a checking session is gonna jump off for sure. But I'm proud of my city yesterday um, for just, you know, handling things the way that it should have been done, man. To basically be on one accord. And to be on one voice saying, look, we don't want you here, man. And, and that's the way it should have been done. And that's done. the way it should have been done. And and, yeah. and I ain't going to lie. If the school had to shut it down and this story ended a week ago, a week or so ago, that would have been all right. But the way that shit was down last night, that's the most Memphis way. And that's the way that people like Martin Luther King, who came to this city to fight for change. 100%. That's the way. That's the blueprint he left behind. Because, see, the very people mm -hmm. that said the, those things – all those tweets, the violent mob, the wow, yep. they're hurting this young boy yep. who up yep. on the stage, yep. they're attacking him. They said the same shit about the sanitation protests mm -hmm. that got that brought Martin yep. Luther King here to Memphis. Yep. And it's just like to me, it's like there is obviously in a lot of ways, there is you've got to let the market speak, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what do the people say? say? Right. Like, what do they want? Do they want to hear what he has to say, or do they not? And they didn't. And they didn't. It's like, we don't want you on our campus. Get the hell up out of here. And that is, and that is, if that is not free thought, democracy, all those things <clears throat> happening in real time, that's what we saw last night. Mm -hmm. And you can choose to not like it, and that's fine. But in the end, man, like... They did it in the most Memphis way possible. They got up. They pro they got they, his and, ass up out of here. They protested <laughs> in said, one get accord. Get your ugly ass up out of here. Asked him questions he was not ready, ready to, to answer. answer. Got his ass off the stage and then partied afterwards. Yep, exactly. And that was so fire. Man, I loved it, man. I loved every bit of it, man. <laughs> and the whole freedom of speech thing, man. Freedom of speech is for the oppressed, not the oppressor. 
It, it, it doesn't give you the right to continue to oppress me. That's not how freedom of speech is supposed to work. You know what I mean? And those young people last night, they felt like the oppressed, and they used their their they used their right to their right to freedom of speech, and they got that ass up out of there. And I loved it. I watched it all night long till I fell asleep, and I woke up being called a dope. Still, still smiling. Yeah, I woke up still smiling, being called a dope. Looking up the dictionary. An ass hat. <laughs> white people, man, racist white people. Y'all can come up with some wild ass words, man. It's, ass hat's not a bad one. I'm, I'm gonna start using. I'm gonna start bringing them to my vocabulary. I'm gonna go back and check my mentions. But I, I deleted the tweets, so the mentions are gone. I should I should have saved some of those derogatory terms. I have a question for and you. Use them joints. Go ahead. This is this is something we have not discussed, mm -hmm. so you we might have to cut this part out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Been seeing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, questions about. Well, Kenny, you dope. Why are why are we that upset about Kyle Rittenhouse? He didn't kill any black people. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it. Uh, I don't mind talking about that at all. Um, I'm gonna give you some breaking news. When this stuff first went down, I didn't know that, that that's what he did. I found that out after the fact. It took me a while before I realized that it wasn't black people that he killed. Because I, because my thing was like, okay, bro, why is this? How is this dude still operating like this? Because like, if he killed black people, like, how is this dude still? Like it seemed like it would have been some 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 type of justice brought to this dude, whether it was uh, 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 Abraham Lincoln and George Washington's justice or or uh, street or street justice, right? Yeah. So I was like, oh, when I found out it was white guys, and I looked into that story, I was like, oh, okay, cool. That's why he's still, you know, what I mean, operating uh, with with the with the liberty that he has, right? Because I think it would have been a much bigger deal. Because I know that story just kind of faded out, and I wondered how, why did it fade out so fast. But once I realized that it wasn't black people, I understood why. The reason why black people are offended. Can you take me somewhere I don't want to go? But that's fine. We're going to stay here. Um, the reason why black people are so in arms about it is because it was a a rally for a black cause. And he came causing this dysfunction. And he killed somebody that was an ally or what we thought was an ally. They, they were there on the ally side in the event, right? And that's the whole thing because it's, it was a black – it was an event to bring justice to a black person. And you came with the bullshit. You know what I mean? That's that's what that whole thing uh, boils down to. And um, like I said, Retro, he's that's always been my thing, man. Like people say, well, the, the, this person was trying to fight the police or all these type of things. But it's not the police job to execute them. They're not executioner, man. Their job is to bring that person to justice. Like that's it. They're supposed to. They're supposed to. Uh, what's the word? Is it subdue him? They're supposed to like. Detain. Detain him and bring yeah. him to justice. Like, that's all you're supposed to do. Like, you're not supposed to, like... De-escalate. Yeah, the police's job is not to... Escalate, but Oh, I, I saw, I, yeah, you know, you were trying to rob a bank. Let me, your justice, I mean, your your verdict is... Death. Death penalty, pow! Like, that's not <laughs> what it, how it works, man. You know what I mean? So, um, I think that's the whole thing to it. But, um, like I said, man... You, you listen to a lot of the people that are, you know, supportive mm -hmm. of... The Cal Rittenhouses of the world, and I and I listen to what the other people got to say too, because I try would, to understand why they think they were. They would, they. I think that's that's mm -hmm. a. If you were to get them with some truth serum, they would say that's the way things should be done. God, yeah. those guys, those allies of that cause of that mm -hmm. protest that got that where Cal Rittenhouse showed up. Yeah, they should have been put down. They should have been put to death. Like yeah. they should have. Like that's just that that is justice playing out in real time. And that's the scary thought. Yeah, man. I don't. I don't think people really want to sign up for that because they, they do they, not. They don't realize how many people will be knocking on their door to they avenge do them. You know what I mean? They do not. So, because we live, we live in a world where there are a lot of systems that are set up to, to attack uh, the oppressed. You know what I mean? So, I ain't gonna go too deep into that, man. Because y'all get mad at me when I get to doing all that, and I don't feel like I don't feel like arguing with y'all. Or I could take the the Roman Cleary approach. Like, hey, whatever. F all y'all. <laughs> F all y'all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, man, for uh, Kenny Stubblefield behind the glass, uh, props to my man, Roman Cleary, coming through again, uh, doing a great job. Keep doing what you're doing, Roman, for sure. I got your back, man, for sure. A lot of your firsts, they're going to be on me. I might need to confirm that with his parents to make sure they are. Yeah, right. you got to talk to, you gotta talk to <laughs> hey. Mama Cleary first. Hey, man. All that Roman needs to come hang out with me, man. Nah, Get to town, man. I might tell Roman to stay away. <laughs> put, some, put some press on some folks out here, man, me and my boy Roman. <laughs> But yeah, baby, we're about to slide about this joint, man. We'll see you guys next time. See y'all next week on the Anthony Sane Show. We out. Thank you for listening to the Anthony Sane Show. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a rating and a review wherever you download your podcasts. Also, like and subscribe to Bluff City Media's YouTube page. For comprehensive coverage of Memphis sports, head over to www.bluffcitymedia.co and find out how you can become an insider. We will see you back here next week.